Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to day two um, of the Municipal Finance Conference. This is track one, uh, breakout number two. My name's Dave Abel. Um, I'm a municipal advisor with Columbia Capital Management. I want to first give a, a quick thank you to the Brookings Institute uh, and to its predecessor, uh, uh, Dan and Rich and Brandeis and Washington U. Um, we're now in our eighth year of connecting practitioners and academic uh, research. We have three papers to cover in a, roughly a 90 minute with a 10 minute Q&A between each. Um, and each deals with a particular type of event or signal and we're measuring the market's reaction. <clears throat> Our first paper was delivered by Kim Kernagy, associate professor at the University of Pennsylvania. Kim is gonna explore the use of bond insurance and what are the sector, sector implications uh, post-2008 with the narrowing of rating spreads between insured and underlying ratings. Scott Richberg, head of public finance at Build America Mutual, will, will uh, critique Kim's work. Our second paper is Jim Naughton, assistant professor at Kellogg at Northwestern. Jim explores whether GASB 68, dealing with uh, systemic assets and liability disclosure is informing uh, public policy and budget decisions. Gilbert Southwell with uh, Wells Capital Management will uh, comment on Jim's work. <clears throat> and our third paper, Chuck Boyer, a PhD candidate at the University of Chicago. Chuck will explore whether the legal rulings coming out of Puerto Rico are creating a measurable legal uncertainty uh, for state issuers that don't have access to Chapter 9, quasi-sovereign credits. Um, Chuck will probably spend a little time on special revenues and statutory lien implications as well. And Natalie Cohen, um, founder of National uh, Muni Research, will comment on Chuck's work. So with our limited time budget, we're going to go ahead and get started with Kim's paper. Come on up, Kim. Thank you. Thanks very much, David. Uh, so first, thanks to the organizers for uh, including our paper on the program. And my thanks to, uh, sure, yeah, sure. My thanks to John and to Zhang for uh, the heavy lifting on the project. Um, I will just start by saying I'm here to learn, not to lecture. This is a work in progress. We're, we've done everything we can with all of the publicly available and commercially available data. But I'm an academic, not a practitioner. If, you, if I've overlooked institutional details that are relevant, I would be very grateful to, to hear from you. So the big picture question is uh, who benefits from municipal bond insurance? Um, we are going to look at liquidity and yield effects, taking seriously the endogenous choice that issuers make whether or not to insure their bonds. We understand there's going to be some selection effects uh, uh, to, to account for. Um, we're going to find uh, insignificant uh, liquidity benefits. We're going to find that largely the benefit of bond insurance is determined by the, ins by the credit rating of the insurance company. Both in the secondary market and in the primary market, we're going to find as long as the insurance company is AAA rated, investors seem to value that insurance and pay for it. But when the insurance companies have lower credit ratings, the value of their insurance seems to accrue only to issuers that have credit ratings lower than the insurance company. And so we take away from that a couple of things. Number one, it seems that investors in this space really value the AAA certification, perhaps even more than the actual uh, coverage. And um, number two, two things to think about that happened after, uh, during and after the financial crisis. Not only were the insurance companies downgraded, but with Moody's scale recalibration, most uh, general obligation bonds were upgraded one to four notches. So the difference between the perceived credit quality between the issuer and the insurance company has, has really been squeezed. So we're left with a sort of a two-part puzzle. Number one, why do now relatively high-rated issuers pay for relatively low-rated insurance? And number two, again, the so, so um, I don't believe that the insurance has no value. It has intrinsic value, right? The joint probability uh, of default has to be lower than the individual probability of default as long as there's imperfect correlation. So the puzzle is why the investors don't seem to be paying for it. A uh, quick look at Puerto Rico's bonds. There's no question that insurance accrues value to investors in the case of default, right? So we're, we're, we're going to concede that point, but what we want to know is whether that, that, that value 
translates into lower offering yields to the taxpayers that are actually paying the premiums. Because these default, defense are, default events are so infrequent, it's, it's not obvious. Um, only thing I want to say about data, two things. Number one, first, thanks sincerely to Scott and his um, colleagues at Build America Mutual who have helped us better understand this data. And, and number two, a caution to other researchers who want to purchase mergent data. I would encourage you not to use the mergent data at face value. There's a fair number of unhelpful aspects to the mergent muni data um, that Scott and his team helped us uh, uncover. So starting with the uh, secondary market, uh, almost 10 years ago now, Professor Bergstresser and his uh, colleagues identified this yield inversion where insurance, insured bonds face higher yields than, than uninsured bonds with the same credit rating. This is a 10-year-old uh, sort of empirical fact. Um, what we're bringing here is, uh, with more comprehensive data, we're going to show that that yield inversion is specific to the issuers who have credit ratings that are as high or higher than the insurance companies. That's the novel finding here. So if you look, um, oh, my pointer doesn't work. If you look at those point estimates, uh, that, that's, uh, that's the estimate on the insured coefficient. And in the pre-crisis period, you can see that it appears insurance is lowering secondary market yields. In the post-crisis period, that appears to not be the case for the AA and single-A rated uh, issuers, but you can see in that triple B and unrated, sorry, forget about the unrated, that's an, another anomaly. In the triple B rated space, it appears that the insurance is still providing some uh, value. This is breaking apart the uh, underlying rating, the spur from S&P or the underlying rating from Moody's on the left, and the insurance company rating uh, across the top. What you can see is provided that the insurance company maintained its triple A rating, it was still providing some benefit in terms of lower yields. When the insurance companies became double A, single A, triple B rated, you can see they continue to provide some insurance value to the issuers that have lower credit ratings. The yield inversion is occurring only in the issuers that have higher credit ratings. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to uh, walk through the estimation of these transaction cost functions. I'm going to just show you the functions. Quick time out from, from my paper to just say hallelujah to the MSRB. What you can see here is the transaction cost functions have shifted substantially after the MSRB's uh, um, disclosure requirements for, for, for trade prices. Um, when Professor Harris and Commissioner Pivovar first published their study, investors were paying about 135 basis points in a half spread to trade a $5,000 uh, trade in a, in a municipal bond on average. After the MSRB's transaction cost disclosure, that half spread dropped to about 85 basis points. So, you know, three cheers here for uh, this disclosure. Unfortunately, however, that 85 basis points is pretty stable, irrespective of whether the bond is insured or not. In the paper, we're going to control for every observable thing and find that there really just doesn't seem to be any improvement in the liquidity of these bonds if they're wrapped. Um, to the primary market analysis, whether or not the actual offering yield appears better, um, we're going to do lots of, um, we're going to do some simple comparisons and then we're going to do some fancier econometrics that are going to allow us to more cleanly identify. W what we're going to specifically do in these selection models is we're going to, we're going to look within a state, within a year, and look within use of proceeds. So our comparison, our identification is going to be coming from comparing a, a school district in Pennsylvania to another school district in Pennsylvania in a specific year. We're not going to be comparing insured bonds in one year to uninsured bonds in another year or insured bonds in one state to uninsured bonds in another state. It, we're going to have very precise um, uh, identification. Here's basically the paper in a, in a picture in the top. So what I'm, what I'm showing you here are the uh, distributions of offering yields. And in the top, you can see this is the 1985 to 2007 period. The insured bonds are the blue uh, are, the, are, the, are the blue, and the uninsured bonds are the red, and you can see that the distribution of offering yields for insured bonds is strictly lower than, than the uninsured bonds, as you would expect. Uh, however, in 2008, those, those yield distributions shift, and you see that the insured bonds are now pricing at higher yields. 
without doubt there's selection here, and that's what we're going to try to control for. Here are the unconditional differences. You can see in the, in the early, you just focus on the red numbers, if you will. Uh, the, the, in the 85 to 99 period, we can see that insured bonds priced at offering about 20 basis points lower on average than those without insurance. Uh, in the period just prior to the crisis, that benefit is, is reduced to about 10 basis points. But the really puzzling part is after the crisis, on average insured bonds price at about 63 basis points higher. That's an unconditional average difference. My job is to try to shrink that 63 basis points as close to zero, maybe even drive it negative, by identifying all the reasons why somebody might choose to buy insurance. So that's what we're going to do next. Um, first thing is a simple OLS regression, where we're going to start only with the uninsured bonds, we're going to fit the model based on all observables. This is macroeconomic variables as well as issuer and issue characteristics, including fixed effects for states. Um, and again, thanks to uh, Scott and his uh, colleagues at Build America Mutual um, reminding us the importance of the call feature in this market, which we're now also controlling for. Um, so what we're going to do is predict what the yield would have looked like on the insured bonds, shy of insurance, and then we're going to compare that fitted yield to the actual observed yield. If we see a negative value, that's going to imply that the insurance reduced the offering yield. Um, so that's just some, a quick picture of what that looks like. You can see that in the period prior to 2012, on average, we do see that the actual yields on insured bonds are lower than the fitted values, suggesting insurance was providing that value. But starting in 2012, that is no longer the case. Again, in the interest of time, I'll defer you to the paper for the specifics. It's not very straightforward to translate from offering yields to dollars saved and lost. And that's because the insured bonds tend to be longer maturity and smaller in size. So there's uh, a little bit of uh, extra work that has to be done. This is what the slide looks like when I look at actual dollars saved or lost. And it looks like dollars lost, money left on the table by issuers uh, buying uh, insurance that they weren't getting a sufficient benefit for, for starts as early as 1997. In our using our expanded model, where we've got a uh, an R squared of about 90 percent, it looks like over this 30 year time period that spans from 1985 to 2016, the grand total benefit of insurance appears to be about 460 million dollars. That's across 30 years across all issuers, 50,000 issuers of general obligation uh, and revenue bonds. For context, that's a roughly equivalent to the revenues MBIA, MBIA generated in 2004. So it, you, you get the point. The, however, that's a, that's a grand total, that's a grand average. What I want to do next is break apart the gains and losses according to the credit quality of the issuer. And if you'll focus, let me just show, if you'll focus on this column here, what you'll see, these are, I apologize for the double negatives, these are losses. So what you can see from the top rows, yes, MBA and AMBAC were actually able to sell insurance to municipals that had underlying AAA ratings, and those issuers left a lot of money on the table, right? So the issuers that were AAA, AA, and single A appear to have lost money on insurance, but the issuers that were B appear to have gained. So we're concluding that there seems to be some subsidization in this market where the highest quality AAA, AA issuers seem to be subsidizing the triple B and lower rated issuers. Um, in the interest of, yeah, uh, I, I, I've got four minutes, please. Um, I, I'm delighted at the coffee. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to walk through all of the uh, uh, propensity uh, scores and the doubly robust inverse probability weighted regression adjustment. Uh, I would defer you to the paper. It is a very slick uh, methodology that allows us to leverage our knowledge of the outcome model to draw inferences from a selection model. It's a great econometric tool. What this is going to allow us to do is take that 63 basis points I said I was going to try to kill. We're going to drive it all the way down to four basis points. 
Unfortunately, that four basis points is still statistically significantly positive, which is still a puzzle why the insurance is not driving those yields negative, but at least a four basis point cost seems more, it's an easier pill to swallow than 63 basis points. So I, I can hear you thinking, you have to be wrong, and I'm with you, we have to be wrong. The insurance has intrinsic value. The joint probability of default has to be lower than the individual probability of default. So we have to have omitted variables. Here's the problem. <laughs> Any omitted variable has to have been completely irrelevant prior to 2008, suddenly highly relevant starting in 2012. It needs to be observable to the investors in this market and to the issuers, but completely unobservable to the rating agencies and completely unobservable to us. We have a complete army of research assistants that has found every publicly available piece of information, and we have used the taxpayer's money to purchase every commercially available piece of information. We're controlling for everything observable that we can. So it's whatever that unobservable variable, it, whatever that observable variable is that we've overlooked, please tell me and I'll be happy to rewrite the paper. Um, so the final thing we wanna do is look at why some investors might be leaving uh, money on the table, so to speak. Uh, we're going to look at you know, potential conflicts of interest at the underwriters. If the underwriters have to hold inventory for any length of time, they're probably going to prefer insurance. Um, we're going to look at advisors. Uh, if you were here last year, you saw a nice paper showing there's a lot of heterogeneity in the uh, quality and incentives of municipal advisors. Not every advisor is as qualified as David or other advisors in the room who are here are probably the highest quality, most informed advisors. Um, so, so you know, the 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 uh, there's some evidence that the recent um, pay-to-play restrictions, restrictions on gifts and gratuities, fiduciary duty, these new rules that have come out of the MSRB in 2014. There's some evidence from, from academics and from the SEC that there's non-compliance with these new regulations. And so, you know, some space on, you know, shoring up the lower tail, if you will, of the, of the advisors, I think, is, is, uh, is, is fruitful additional research. I'm out of time, so let me just say that we do have some evidence that the most influential, potentially conflicted underwriters and, and advisors, and the, dare I, dare I say, um, issuers that have uh, observably more corruption, uh, as evidenced by conviction and prosecution rates of officials, tend to leave more money on the table than, uh, than their less corrupt, uh, or at least, at least less observably corrupt peers. So there is some, <laughs> there's, there is some evidence here for some, for some conflicts of interest. So uh, I am out of time, I'll sit. Um, insurance is valuable, provided the insurance company has a higher credit rating than the issuer. Thanks so much. Shall I sit there? Yeah. All right, so after that, you'll be surprised that I actually agree with a fair amount of what Kim said, okay? Um, and I just think it's how you look at it and view it and state it because there were some very obvious things that were just stated um, but presented as like uh, newfound uh, observations. So AAA rating is better than AA rating. Any disagreement? AAA rated bonds, AAA rated insurers are better than higher credit quality in the, in the eyes of the rating agency than AA, okay? The next is bond insurance benefits issuers who have credit ratings that are generally equal to or lower than the rating of the insurer, okay? So Build American Mutual is rated AA. My competitor, Assure Guarantee, is rated AA. We do not sell bond insurance to AAA rated companies or uh, AAA rated municipalities because they don't receive a benefit from 
enhancing their credit quality, reducing the investor's perception of default and uh, loss. So I saw Ben Watkins earlier. Ben doesn't buy bond insurance from ourselves or from Assured because Ben's bonds are rated double A and maybe some are rated triple A. Okay, so that is a fact and we can walk through all of the math of it, but that is a, a given. So when the rating company, when the insurers were rated triple A, 85% of the market, maybe 90% was insurable, meaning that they could apply their insurance to those bonds and it would reduce the cost of the borrowing, okay? Post-crisis, Kim is correct. The previous companies' ratings went down and they are no longer writing business. There's only two companies writing business and that's Assured and ourselves and we started in 2012 and built our company based upon all of the lessons that were learned during the crisis and what we saw happen to the prior structures, okay? So today, the insurable market is generally bonds that are rated AA minus to triple B minus. That's about 30% of the market, okay? And as Kim noted, that is because the insurance companies are now AA, not AAA, and many of the underlying credit ratings of the bonds have been upgraded. So I forget the table, that she has a table in there where she shows pre-crisis, post-crisis, uh, the credit ratings that are AA and AAA, pre-crisis were about 30%, post-crisis, now they're 60%, okay? And that's because S&P fundamentally changed how they rate, I mean, uh, Moody's changed how they fundamentally rate municipal bonds and they upgraded everything in wholesale. S&P took a little bit of a different approach, but they ultimately upgraded the bond. So the insurable market, the number of insurers who benefit from bond insurance is absolutely smaller than it was pre-crisis. It's now about 100, million, 100 billion a year of potential clients that benefit from bond insurance. About 25% of those issuers purchase bond insurance, okay? So when you look at the overall usage of bond insurance post-crisis versus pre-crisis, it's about 6% of issuers buy bond insurance because it saves them money. The other 94 don't buy bond insurance in aggregate, okay? The breakdown of who, who buys our bond insurance, who uses it, okay? And I'll get into a discussion about who actually bears the cost of insurance. Is it issuers or is it really the investors who demand the insurance? So <clears throat> only about 4% of bonds that are rated in the AA category buy bond insurance, okay? Those are primarily AA minus bonds that investors might have a different viewpoint on. They might view that that bond is currently rated AA, but they think it might become downgraded and go into the A category. So they want to buy protection today for that future event. And they're going to make that decision to buy insurance on that particular AA minus versus another AA minus based upon their opinion of the credit quality, the future ratings, the future credit quality of that bond, okay? And I think part of, and I'll get into where I think the math becomes noisy, is Kim is comparing the yield that that AA minus sold with the insurance where the investor wanted it and paid for it to the AA minus that the investors didn't have the same credit concern. They didn't buy the bond insurance. So you're comparing this apple to this orange could be within the same state, whatever, but you're still comparing different things. So I'll suggest and I'll give examples of you should focus on issuers where, that have insured and uninsured bonds outstanding and look exactly how those bonds trade, okay? That's how you really know. You have to really get narrow on when you're uh, analyzing where would an uninsured bond sell if it didn't have insurance, okay? Um, <clears throat> uh, so, they describe the issuers who use bond insurance, that 100 billion that would qualify and the 25 billion that actually purchase it as opaque, lowly rated. We're talking about A plus, A rated, and some triple B. Only about 15% of the business that we and Assure do is in the triple B category, okay? So 
I would just be careful when you're def calling something lowly rated and it's an A rated uh, municipal credit across the, you know, across the country. I'm not sure that they would consider themselves lowly rated or opaque and definitely I'm not going to, the whole corrupt and all that other stuff is kind of interesting. Maybe I need to take that into account as a credit factor when I'm, uh, you know, analyzing, um, you know, the analysis. So who pays for the bond insurance? Multiple times in the paper it states that issuers are losing money and it's costing taxpayers. It's just not true, okay? Investors demand bond insurance on certain bonds and not on others. Issuers do not willy-nilly just put bond insurance on a deal for no apparent reason. They only buy bond insurance if they save money. And on every insured deal, there is an issue price certificate that is executed by the financial advisor and the underwriter that states that the bond insurance saved money and it quantifies how much. So I recommend that you look at issue price certificates for transactions so you can see exactly where the experts who know the differences between one Pennsylvania school district versus another Pennsylvania and the investors who are buying that school district versus that one. Why did the investor want it here and here? The issue price certificate quantifies that on that particular issue. Happens on every transaction. The attorneys, bond counsel require that issue price certificate to give their tax opinion on that transaction. So that's another a piece that I would uh, you know, refer you to. I'll give a specific example of a transaction we did last week for UC Riverside, University of California, student housing bonds. The issuer and the underwriter offered the market insured bonds at these rates and uninsured bonds at these rates. There was about a 20 to 25 basis point differential between the two, okay? And they're like, here's the buffet, choose. And this is effectively how bond insurance is used on every transaction. An investor can say, I prefer insurance on this bond or I don't prefer insurance on this bond. So on this particular deal where the investors were given the explicit choice to buy insurance or not buy insurance, investors bought bond insurance on the first eight years of the transaction. The next five years sold without insurance. And then in 2043 and 2044, those bonds sold with insurance again. Seems crazy. Why? It's the same issuer, same credit, definitely in the same state. So why did someone want bond insurance and it didn't? Must be crazy. The investor who wanted the bond insurance paid a price of a little over $121 a bond, 121.5 to be exact, okay? The uninsured bonds were $119. So that investor paid two and a half points higher to get the insurance, okay? Our insurance costs one and a half. So the issuer netted, saved 1%, okay? So the investor demanded the insurance, they paid the issuer to put the insurance on that maturity, okay? And a bunch of the other maturities and save the issuer probably half a million dollars. On that particular maturity, it was about seven and a half million, 1%, 75,000 on that particular deal. That very simple economic analysis happens on every deal, okay? On that deal, if we were charging 3% instead of one and a half, so the investor, the issuer would have looked at the math and go, hold on, I'm getting 121, 119, I'm losing 50 cents. I'm not gonna sell, I'm not gonna accept that order for the, un, for the insured bond. I'm gonna sell the uninsured bond. The math is that simple, it's that basic, okay? On the point of sale, the issuer decides, do I save money using bond insurance or don't I save money? If I do, they include insurance and they have a benefit for doing so. If they don't save money, they don't include the bond insurance. It's that simple, okay? And I, I take it minus is I'm over. Okay. Yeah. I was trying to put this graph up, but I couldn't figure out how to, to do so. So what's our budget for Q&A? Eight minutes? Okay. Um, please say, say, say your name uh, and David or Felicia, the mic, you know, the mic. Okay. Is that better? Yes. All right. Say your name and affiliation. Natalie? 
I know. Uh, I Natalie know. Cohen, National Municipal Research. So, um, a subject that's also near and dear to my heart, uh, having worked in the bond insurance business. I, I'd like to offer a couple of thoughts on your dilemma that you presented in your paper. Um, the rating agencies recalibrated the ratings. Um, that was not uncontroversial, what they did in a lot of respects. If you notice more recently, uh, in the last five years, there have been significant downgrades, almost recreating the former ratings map. Um, the process by which that happened was uh, matrix mapping of prior ratings to new ratings when they did the recalibration without necessarily looking at each individual credit. And so as each individual credit has come to market, some of those ratings have come down. Um, in that context, I would offer that um, there are a couple of other factors that bond insurance has that it offers the investor, which is um, a surveillance team that's constantly monitoring the credits. So the investor may not see actions that happen behind the screen of the bond insurance to, um, you know, um, amend or mediate in situations that are moving into a more distressed scenario. So you wouldn't see that it's maybe not an A, but a triple B plus or uh, B double A at that point. So you wouldn't see that effect. Secondly, um, there are legal teams available to work out a scenario, as we've seen in a number of examples with Detroit, Puerto Rico, and so on. Um, and then finally, I would suggest that uh, the rating of the bond insurance is also a mitigant to volatility in the market, particularly since ratings have come down, recalibrated up, and some come down. Some have come down multiple notches that haven't been insured. But with the insurance, there's less... I don't, I don't have the evidence yet as far as volatility, but there are a number of examples out there. So I would just suggest those three things are sidebars to your paper. Thank, th thanks very much, Natalie. L let me also, um, so, two, so two things in response to Natalie. First, um, I studied very carefully the actual recalibration, but I confess I haven't followed the downgrades that followed. I will absolutely look. I think that's fascinating and relevant to several papers I'm working on. And also to thank Scott again for his time. Um, uh, we are looking, I should, let me just, for context, we're looking at the industry, that's over 10 insurance companies over 30 years, and Build American Mutual is probably the smallest player out of those 10 over that 30-year period. So there's very little influence from, let me say it like this, it's entirely possible every piece of insurance Build America Mutual sells is highly valuable, and everybody else is, you know, maybe MBA and AMBAC are the. So we haven't done the 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 uh, we haven't done the evaluation by insurance company. I now will definitely go home and do that. That may or may not be publishable, but I'm personally curious. Um, so so it's um, there. There are in of out of our ten insurance companies, some of them were selling uh, insurance to AAA rated issuers and to uh, AA-rated issuers with single-A insurance for some periods of time. So for, for sure, the money left on the table is, is being driven by the high, relatively high-quality credits. No question, this entire asset class is largely investment grade. When I'm talking about opacity, I mean the muni space is opaque relative to corporates because the, disclo the issuer disclosure is so poor. Right, we need standardized CAFA reporting with XBRL. I mean, there's that. It's an opaque asset class across the board. I also think that the, when I'm saying relatively, and I use the word relative, when I say the word relatively low quality, I mean inside the asset class. So because most municipals are double A, saying that a single A credit is relatively low credit, I mean inside the asset class. But I take your point. The whole space is high credit quality, which is one of the fundamental reasons that makes people say, why would you need insurance in this space rather than structured products or corporate bonds, for example. But I, ta I take your point. There's a single A credit is a high quality credit. And the, you know it's entirely possible that the insurance being written by a double A rated Build American Mutual to triple B rated issuers is, we're finding that's highly valuable. So it's, it's not a paper about Build American Mutual yeah. per se. 
I mean, I was trying to represent the industry. And I think that we all in the industry would agree with you. Or, oh, do I have to push a button? Yep. yep. Which one? There you go. Okay. Uh, that we agree what you call opaqueness is we actually focus on smaller issuers, mm -hmm. okay, that are not followed by the big institutional mm -hmm. credit analysts, okay. Uh, and I'll use Ben again as just an example because mm -hmm. I like Ben picking on him. But uh, he has credit analysts all across the street who follow his transactions, okay. They know his credit inside and out, okay. They dedicate staff and resources to study that. All the big issuers have the same kind of following, okay. We bring the same market access and efficiency to smaller issuers that the large institutional investors don't follow. They're not going to study a $10 million transaction because to them, buying $500,000 of a transaction isn't worth dedicating the time of their professional staff to, um, to study that credit. That's where we step in. We analyze over 4,000 bond deals a year. We insure, I think, 1,200, 1,500 bond deals. Our average deal size is $10 million, okay? So we, by definition and by construct, are focused on smaller, what you would call opaque, lesser known, not followed, and we are giving those smaller issuers the same access and cost efficiencies to enter the market as many of the big guys. And we're finding value in the insurance for those issuers. Okay. I would just say work on the titles Absolutely. because the title of the paper is bond insurance okay. uh, that was picked up is not valuable. Okay, so, Out, outsource monitoring. We have some up here. We got to get at least one more question in. Dan, go ahead. So, uh, Scott, I want to I want to drill down on one thing that I heard you say that actually was in somewhat tension with something that a different representative from the bond insurance industry said in, in this conference a while ago, and it, it had to do with the model of how people choose uh, within within an issuer to insure specific uh, specific QSEPs. Now, what you described is something where it's driven by the investor demand, but. Mm -hmm. In a different context, sort of a different representative from the bond insurance industry described the way that the industry creates value is by looking within issuer where the rating assigned by the rating agency is the same across all of the bonds regardless of maturity True. and being able to ass uh, assess, you know, to what maturity are we willing to underwrite this risk? Is that and That's these, a true statement. but they feel somewhat in tension to me and in the description of the bond insurer as somebody who is uh, not responding purely to the investor demand sort of instrument by like you know bond by bond but somebody who's actually making within an issuer a credit judgment based on maturity versus what you described which is what you're describing is a situation that applies more to a revenue bond issue and I'll give a gas tax as an example okay and again it is based on investor demand okay and <clears throat> So think of gas taxes, think of electric cars, think of everything that is potentially going to be a challenge to gas tax revenues going forward, all right? Are most investors going to be comfortable where uh, gas taxes are going to be in two years? Probably. What about in 28 years, okay? What about a rental car facility that is purely, um, you know, built off of revenues from that rental car? So... There are certain credits that have a different risk profile based on the duration because things can change. Generally, cities, counties, this paper is more on geo bonds, doesn't have that distinguishing factor, but a revenue bond, that that revenue could be threatened more and more as time goes on, that absolutely is a true fact. So I don't think those are intention. I think they're saying the same thing, and I think an investor on a 2028 maturity might want insurance on a gas tax deal where they wouldn't want it on a two-year maturity. Well, that okay. certainly raises a number of issues relative to the business model as well. For example, pre-2008, we ceded liability through advance refunding. Now, we see that happens a lot less, you know, later down the line, and it might introduce, from my perspective, a question of low coupons. Should they have a higher uh, a premium because you're liable to be outstanding for a longer period without being advance refunded? I mean, these are things you probably can't yeah. fairly price, but I think they seep into the discussion at some level. Can so, I comment uh, on that? Or? Well, one more. Gosh, so many questions. Um, go ahead, Ann. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks. Ann Canfield, thank okay. you. Um, just as an additional observation, I think 
there, there's many more new is, is coming out in the discussion here. There's seem to be many more nuances um, to this overall subject and how the market operates that would I think be worth exploring. And but secondly, with re interest of um, in the issue of municipal disclosure, um, Build America had brought a unique feature to the market. They worked with the SEC and the OCC on a summary financial disclosure statement that's up on their website. It's available to everybody. So any bond that they insure uh, summarizes that issuer's financials, and then it's updated annually. And that's a really, really good thing for the market. And so it's it's very helpful. And so, so a variation on, on outsourced monitoring as a, yeah, it's particularly as a value add? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> okay. particularly for these smaller issuers. That uh, you know that aren't covered as as well by some of the bigger firms. Okay. Well, I have two more pages of moderated directive uh, moderator prerogative questions, which I can't cover, and I'm sorry I'm missing everybody else in the room. We're now about three minutes in overtime, so I want to skip the second paper started. Um, Jim Notton, you want to come on up? Morning. There we go. All right. Okay. Thank you. Um, so uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so this paper is joined with um, uh, Mike, who's in the audience, and uh, Omri, who is. Uh, back home in California, busy collecting data. Uh, we've been very fortunate to have Gil as our discussant. He's already given us a lot of help. Um, I hope paper. it was helpful. <laughs> and so we've been uh, trying to incorporate some of it for this presentation and uh, a lot more to come. So uh, just as an introduction, uh, it's a simple what, why, how of what we're, what we're doing. Um, so we're looking at the importance of the GASB. So um, within the municipal space, there's at least from an economic standpoint, there's a lot of papers that look at budgeting. Um, and there's uh, a pretty strong belief in, in the academic literature that budgeting is really what drives decisions at the, at the municipal level. And so what we're trying to do in this paper is to try to bring in this idea that, that GASB reporting also plays a role. Um, so what we look at more specifically is just a change in the GASB recording requirement, uh, see if it changes some um, economics at the municipal level. Um, and, and the idea is that uh, it's not that the budget is not important. We, you know, we're going to acknowledge that the budget is still probably the most important thing. Uh, it's just that GASB uh, reporting requirements also play a role. Um, and the thing that we do that's, that's sort of novel in this study is really sort of uh, look at GASB 68, um, look at sort of the differential impact of that standard across municipalities to try to identify whether those that are differentially affected um, make different economic choices going forward. So I'll talk about that in, in quite a bit more detail in the next, next few slides. But that's sort of the, the overview um, of what we're going to do. Um, so the key thing is really sort of that, that last part on um, GASB 68. So um, what, what I'm going to talk about here, it's, you know, in academic terms, it's called an identification strategy. The idea is that we want to be able to isolate uh, the effect um, of the standard um, and come up with a control group that allows us to sort of uh, have some assurance that our results aren't driven by other factors, of which, of course, there could be many. So GASB 68, um, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, covers the reporting of defined benefit pension obligations. Uh, in simple terms, you now have to put the net pension liability on your balance sheet. And, and how we exploit this standard is we look at basically two types of plans uh, that were differentially affected. So the two sort of general types are what are referred to as agent plans and what are referred to as cost sharing plans. Uh, so with agent plans, um, the assets are pooled for investment purposes, uh, but they're separate accounts. Um, and so each municipality's share uh, is sort of identifiable and it's only used for their own participants. Uh, and this facilitated reporting prior to GASB 68, whereas with cost sharing plans, everything is pooled and any particular municipality's share is just a pro rata share of the overall pool. Uh, and so when you look at what was done uh, pre gasby 68, for the agent plans, um, uh, they were already disclosing what their obligations were on the pension front. So you could already sort of pull up the, the CAFR 
go through the notes, you could see what the pension obligations were. And what GASB 68 did for those municipalities is it, it, it put that information into the balance sheet. So now there's a number in the balance sheet that was previously disclosed. Whereas with the cost sharing plans, um, uh, the information wasn't disclosed uh, in the CAFRs. Uh, you could still sort of get at some of this information if you looked at the budget, but in the actual financial statements, this information uh, wasn't always uh, clear. There certainly wasn't a separate note that explained uh, what the cost sharing obligations were. Uh, and so for those types of municipalities, there was both a disclosure and recognition effect. So, so what you see here is essentially for one group we have recognition, for the other group we have recognition and disclosure. And by essentially comparing how both move over time, what we're going to try to isolate is the effect of disclosure. So, um, and the goal being that when we look at GASB disclosure, does it change how municipalities operate? Um, Okay, so the, the key thing to, to keep in mind in sort of how we do our tests is it's a very simple difference in difference design. Um, and so what we're not testing explicitly is if you look at the, the, the cost sharing <coughs> municipalities in the pre-period and the post-period, you know, they change, but that change could be for a lot of reasons, right? So it could be that the, you know, uh, there could be economic differences over those, over that time period, there could be other things going on. Uh, and so what we do is essentially the same analysis for the agent plans where there's going to be some difference over time. And what we're trying to claim is that, you know, maybe they do things a little bit different, but there's no reason why the differences should change as a result of the standard unless it's driven by the, the change in disclosure. So um, there's a couple of things here that I'm just going to kind of uh, pause and just uh, make sure we're sort of on the same page. So. Um, you know, I'm an academic, you know, my co-authors are all academics. Um, what we've been able to sort of infer from looking at papers, from looking at um, studies is that w when you look at the cost sharing in the agent municipalities, they are different, right? So um, you, you tend to see slightly larger municipalities tend to have agent plans. Um, and so there are some differences, but um, when you look at a lot of the other sort of underlying um, uh, facts such as sort of revenue per, per, per resident, uh, poverty rate, all, all these sort of things that we look at more generally, we don't see a lot of differences. So um, for those of you that are practitioners that are sort of aware of, of these things, if there are differences um, between these two, that's important for us in this research design. So we don't, we don't need them to be exactly the same, but to the extent that they're different, those are things we need to account for in our research design. So what we've done here is what we, we sort of know about from, from the academic literature, but if there's things on the practitioner side, um, that would be, be very helpful for us. Um, okay, so that's number one. And then number two, we look at economic outcomes, and, and the ones we look at are the ones where you know, we can get sort of clean data or cleaner data. Municipal data in general is a bit messy, uh, but we can get cleaner data across municipalities. Um, so we look at, you know, broad measures of revenue, expenses, and, and employee headcount. Um, um, Gil has given us another, a number of suggestions uh, for this group in terms of things we can look at. Um, but if there's other things that any of you in the audience would think of so, would sort of matter, uh, that would also be, be very, very helpful for us, okay? All right, so again, we're just gonna do a simple difference in difference. Uh, and so what this means is uh, we're gonna collect a, a broad sample. Uh, so you know, how we did this is we, we, we just took a list of um, all the counties uh, in the US uh, census. Uh, we just sorted them by population. Uh, and we took every county that had more than 100,000 residents. And uh, we took three counties from every state. So some states, like Alaska, it turns out there aren't three counties with more than 100,000 people. Uh, so we, we, we pick up a few extra uh, smaller counties there. Um, and so this is just to make sure that we have sort of a comprehensive coverage um, across uh, most states. Uh, there's a few New England states where we, uh, uh, we have to drop data. Um, and, uh, and it's just to sort of give us sort of a, a broad sort of inference from our, uh, our results. Now the thing that was tricky with this is uh, we had to hand collect pretty much all the data from the from the CAFRs. Um, so I think this audience is probably somewhat sympathetic. CAFRs are not uh, very easy to go through. Um, you know, they tend to be uh, very long. They tend not to be kind of structured in, in, a, in a pretty 
uh, usable way. So it took quite a bit of time to collect uh, the data from the coffers. We have other data that we've collected that's not in what we're presenting today. Um, and so if there are other ideas for things in coffers we should be using, uh, don't, don't feel bad for us. Um, <laughs> we can totally, we may have it already, uh, and so it may be, may be something we can use. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna kind of walk through a couple of the, the tables just to give you a, a sense of how we do this. So um, this is a pretty simple regression where we just take, um, um, so across the, um, the counties that we're looking at, some have cost sharing, some have agent, and some have a combination of both. So just for, to keep the analysis simple, we just kind of focus on the ones that only have the, um, uh, the agent and only have the, uh, the cost sharing plans. And then what we did here is we just said, well, which ones are gonna uh, reporting a net pension liability in the year after GASB 68, okay? Um, and so what we find is basically, when you look at the, the revenue measures that we use, the tax revenues per capita, the fee revenue per capita, uh, we don't see any effect. Um, when you look at the expense measures, on the other hand, um, we do see that the cost sharing plans are actually, so those are the ones that are um, um, uh, differentially um, affected by the disclosure as well as the recognition, are reducing uh, salary expenses, or reducing welfare expenses, uh, and they're reducing headcount. And just, just to be clear, it's not that they're reducing headcount as much as relative to the benchmark group, right? So it doesn't mean that the headcount is coming down, it's just coming down relative to the, to the agent, uh, uh, the municipalities with agent plans. Um, and so what we sort of just broadly take from this, there's a reduction in expenses, uh, but no differential change in revenues. Uh, from an academic standpoint, that makes sense to us. Um, uh, many academic studies sort of show that revenues are hard to adjust. Uh, residents don't like tax increases. Um, and so those things tend not to, to adjust very quickly, uh, whereas expenses are things you can, can address uh, uh, much more quickly. So to the extent that we're looking at a year or two after uh, the standard change, this is where we would expect to see uh, the results. Uh, the next thing we do is basically the same analysis, but now we look at uh, those entities that are reporting a net pension asset. So, you know, when we talk about the state of public pensions, when we look at uh, states, we all sort of know they're, they're generally underfunded. There's a few that are well-funded, but uh, there's very few that are what we call uh, overfunded. Um, but once you kind of drill down to the counties, there are actually a meaningful number that are. There's not as many. So there's about 260 observations in these tests versus about 1,500 uh, for the liability. So there are, you know, a smaller number, but there are, there are still um, uh, enough that sort of have the asset. And what we see here is, is a really nice sort of complement um, in the sense that when you look at the salary expenses per capita, what we had in the prior table was that for the cost sharing plans, there was a differential reduction in expenses. They're trying to cut expenses relative to the, uh, to the control group, whereas those that are reporting an asset are actually increasing expenses. Uh, so they actually increase salary uh, more rapidly than the, than the control group. So this to us is sort of an indication that uh, at least um, uh, it, it's not just sort of the, the presence of the, the asset or the liability, but it's actually the direction is sort of influencing uh, decision making. And so then we do one more test where we look at sort of the uh, continuous measure of the net pension liability. So the idea here is, is that among those entities with, the, uh, with, with a net pension liability, if it's a larger net pension liability, uh, there's an even stronger uh, effect. So, um, so what we have sort of between these three tests, if you look at sort of the collective, it's if you report a liability, you reduce expenses. If you report an asset, you increase expenses. And the larger the liability that you report, the more you reduce expenses. So, you know, individually, they're all sort of meaningful, but we think collectively, once you put those three together, that's a pretty strong indication that what's, what's flowing through the Gatsby statements is influencing uh, decision making. Um, so the last thing we do, and this is, this is quite preliminary, um, and this is to be fair, uh, Gil really helped us on this. Uh, so, so when we first kind of put this together, we really had no idea. Um, why this might be the case. We thought a little bit, you know, from, from our, our other sort of work in the corporate sector, there's a certain salience that comes with reporting where if I'm a, an executive and something is showing up on my financial statements, I just pay a little bit more attention to it. And so we sort of had the same idea for the municipal sector where if I'm a municipal manager and it's down my financial statements, I'm gonna just pay a little bit more attention to, to what's going on. Uh, and what Gil suggested, which 
uh, you know, was very helpful was saying, well, the reason that that's probably the case is they're probably worried about what the rating agencies are telling them or the debt market participants. So a lot of the rating agencies will run ratios off of your financial statements. And if you have a new liability showing up there, uh, you know, it could affect some of those ratios. So people just might be more aware of it because of that interaction. Uh, and so we do two cross-sectional tests that just look at sort of roughly sort of very rough proxies of their, their likelihood of being active participants in the debt markets. Um, the, the first is really just looking at sort of, uh, you know, among the group with the, the net pension liability, are you sort of issue more debt or a debt issuer? And what we find um, here is that there's, you know, the same main effect, which is sort of the red, but then there's an incremental effect, the green box, that says there's an incremental reduction uh, beyond the main effect for those that are sort of active in debt markets. Uh, and then we do the same thing, just looking at the, uh, the scaled revenue of the entity. So, so higher uh, revenue municipalities are, are more active in debt markets. Uh, and we find the same thing where there's sort of, there's a similar main effect to before where there's an expense reduction, no change in revenue. Uh, but then there's an incremental expense reduction uh, for those that are uh, high revenue municipalities. Okay. Uh, so collectively, um, you know, what we're, what we're hoping to claim is that the GASB accounting had real economic consequences. Uh, so it's influencing decision making at the, at the county level. Um, and a possible mechanism is because of the interaction with, with that market. So in closing, I just want to say that we're open to other suggestions. This is very early work. Uh, this is our first time presenting it in public. So um, even weeks from now, please email me or my co-authors if, uh, if you have any suggestions. We'd really love to uh, incorporate them in the paper. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you, Jim. Gilbert? Yeah, um, my name is Gil Southwell. I'm a muni analyst. Uh, we manage about $39 billion in muni assets. So um, when I got this paper, um, I was kind of interested to really see uh, if the effects of the disclosure of net pension liability in GASB 68 really was making a behavioral difference in the clients that and the issuers that we buy debt from. Um, I think uh, this is paper is somewhat relevant um, for some of the headline risks that the muni asset class is facing. I think net pension liability and pension liabilities in general are one of the biggest headline risks that we have in the muni asset class. So hopefully, um, if the, some of this research showing its expense reduction is in fact being caused by the new GASB standards, that would be great because we need some discipline here. Uh, first thing, I took, I took a look at the sample uh, and the sample size. Uh, if, looking at counties, I thought was um, a really good idea. They tend to be more sophisticated users of financial statements. Um, these are large counties. There's 502, so I think the sample size is pretty, pretty large. 47 states, so good geographic coverage. As you well know, muni finance and muni reporting varies from state to state to state. Um, I thought this, this research was kind of interesting, too, because it's not the sort of stuff that I could ever do myself. I'm very issuer-focused. I look at one particular issue, issuer probably two or three a day. Um, there's no way I can look at 502 counties and come up with some uh, intelligent data. You also don't get this from the rating agencies. You know, rating agency data is all self-selected. You know, they take a look at their data. It's what they rate. Um, I like the fact that they had non-rated and rated uh, counties in this uh, sample size because I do think that helps uh, some of the validity of the conclusions they've reached. Um, one of the big things that we look at when we're looking at and assessing municipal credit is what's the quality and capability of fiscal management for these issuers. So if in fact some of the research that Jim uh, is coming up with in his team shows that in fact once uh, the net pension liability is properly disclosed on the financial statements, it does cause some beneficial expense reductions, FTE reductions, which then hopefully will translate into more money for pension contributions, that would be a value a behavioral um, result. I'm, I'm a little skeptical that that's uh, occurring uh, across the board, but um, his research has certainly got some interesting um, ideas to it. Um, I think um, he, Jim mentioned before that they're trying to control for counties that have a bond rating and they're subject to the uh, inquiries and discipline of having to face uh, a bond review committee and those that are not rated. I think that's good. Um, there's also some, um, I tried to connect the dots. Why would the disclosure of a net pension liability in a financial statement actually cause a government 
to change their view on expense, expenses, expense ratios, and FTEs. And I think besides the rating effect, um, oftentimes uh, the government, larger governments, they actually have an MDNA. Many smaller governments do not necessarily use an MDNA, but for the larger counties, they clearly have an MDNA management discussion and analysis. And when the 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 issuer's financial team has to go through that, they are clearly having to address the net pension liability that's shown in GASB 68. So that's one dot I was connecting that, yes, the disclosure here would be influencing their behavior when they're drafting the MDNA, which, let's face it, is somewhat of a political statement. You know, they want to polish it up. Um, the other uh, area where I think um, the influence of the pension disclosure would be in preliminary offering or offering statement disclosure. Uh, most of these counties are frequent issuers in the muni market, whether it's rated or not. And the process by which an offering statement is generated with an underwriter or a placement agent does involve the review of the financial statements by the underwriter with the issuer. And clearly, if there's a, a large net pension liability or a uh, trend that the net pension liability is growing, that is going to have to be addressed somewhere. Uh, in the offering statement. So this could be another way that the GASB disclosure of net pension liabilities actually affecting behaviors through deal offerings and the review of the offering statement by the issuer. Um, the, uh, the expense data that they used, um, I think so needs to be a little bit more granular. granular. Um, getting expense data from GASB financial statements, um, there's two levels, you could argue three. So if you're just looking at government expenses, not business enterprise expenses, uh, the government-wide financial statements has a different set of rules, those are full accrual accounting, um, whereas the fund statements are modified accrual. Um, so where you pull your expense data makes a difference, and I know Jim and I have been talking about ways to refine that analysis, or maybe having an analysis based on both government-wide uh, expense ratios and expenses and fund-based uh, uh, financial statements. Also, you know, looking only at government expenses and excluding business enterprise expenses, water, sewer, lighting, electrical systems, gas systems, um, maybe there needs to be some more granularity there. Uh, obviously, expense um, uh, determinations for business enterprises are a little different for a government than their um, social service and, and other um, government expenses. Um, I think um, I have some friends that are CPAs and they exclusively practice in government. Um, and when I mentioned that this study had this finding, they were a little skeptical. Um, many of them said they don't believe their clients, when they're doing their annual budget, look much at the financial statements, especially the net pension liability. So uh, Jim's kind of uh, uncovered maybe an interesting tension here. Either the CPAs are not telling me the truth, uh, or there's something more that's going on here with uh, the change in expenses with the net pension liability. Um, obviously, the sample size and the samp nature of the sample he has here, these are large, sophisticated counties with sophisticated government finance officers. I wonder if this trend that he sees or this, um, these conclusions would be as relevant for smaller cities uh, rural governments, et cetera. I think that would be an interesting uh, continuation of his study. Um, the resources, obviously, that governments have completely vary. State usually has extremely good uh, financial people. We've got one, uh, Ben Watkins is here. I'm sure he's taking this all in. Um, but at the county level, uh, city level, town level, that starts to erode. So the importance of GASB financial disclosure to smaller, unsophisticated issuers may not have the same benefits. Um, I think we also need longer-term data here. Uh, GASB net pension liability really disclosure only started with financial statements. Uh, I think that's for fiscal years ending June 15, 2014. So you figure the first time that most of these financial officers saw their financial statements was sometime in the summer of 2015. By then, the 2015 budget's already been done. So I think Jim's probably got 
relevant data only for the last 18 months, but I think uh, the longer um, view and the more uh, data he can um, analyze over the next couple of years, we'll see if whether or not if his trend uh, holds true. Um, and we talked about the measurement focus too. If you take a look at the government-wide financial statements, which are full of cruel, um, there you might be able to see some of these uh, expense uh, reduction um, more evident than in the fund financial statements, since the fund financial statements tend to be only modified accrual and maybe maybe not are not reflecting all the total expenses. Um, I did I did find the interesting um, that there could be uh, governments that have a pension asset, which I don't know of anyone that I've ever run in and has a pension asset, is actually spending money. That would be very unusual, um, and I think that's probably just um, a result of the way the model works. But when you sit back, I don't think the state of Florida is spending more money just because it's got a net pension asset, because that's not a state asset. It's the asset of the pension plan. So that, to me, didn't make any sense. Um, but overall, um, this is a sort of academic work, believe it or not, that someone like myself as a practicing muni analyst could use, especially if Jim will divulge to me what the answers are for all the 504 counties that he, uh, he surveyed, because I'd like to see who said that they had expense reductions as a result of their net pension liability and which ones didn't. Um, those would be my favorite uh, choices for issuers. And they probably don't need bond insurance. Okay, well, 20 seconds back into the uh, uh, time bank here. Uh, I'll lead with a quick question here. Um, it seems like a punchline is that we're pulling the cover off the cost of, a real cost of an FTE. Um, and is there a longer reaching implication? And did you control for um, reducing FTE and having that show up somewhere else in the form of, for example, a personal services contract? Outsourcing, if you will. That's a great question. That's something that actually Gil kind of brought up as well. So, um, so in what we've presented so far, the answer is no. Um, okay. So we, we really, um, uh, uh, so the data that we use for, for, the, um, for the welfare and the, uh, and the salary were actually taken from the census that um, sort of claim that they do a lot of those adjustments. Um, but when we went back and looked at the actual CAFRs and looked at the actual numbers, um, we're not clear that they, they did all those adjustments. So one of the things we've been doing is to make sure that we have sort of a full suite of all of the expense categories uh, to, to make sure it's sort of an, a reduction and not a shifting, because uh, those are clearly not the, not the same thing. And governments, you know, are pretty uh, clever at shifting expenses around. And the other thing is I think uh, it'd be good if the study would take a look at those expenses that are variable. In other words, they can actually be uh, changed year over year over year. And those that cannot, uh, obviously, if you've got uh, looking at FTE ratios um, for a city or a county that has a union uh, and a union bargaining agreement, the ability to change um, and reduce FTEs would be tougher than it would be in other counties. Also, obviously, if you're looking at government expense, including debt service, debt service generally is not um, negotiable, I hope. Okay, we'll have about seven minutes for audience questions. Anybody here? Microphone over here. Go ahead and give us your uh, name and affiliation as well. Don Boyd, Rockefeller College. Uh, two quick questions. One is, um, did you, uh, could you try to parse out first the magnitude? So I, if I read it right, it was like 14 or 15 cents per capita that the, it, you, which might be why it's, it's hard to see maybe in, in, in kind of, you know, um, anecdotal information. Did you try to look at those? I, I realize you lose your difference in differences design, but did you look at those governments where they moved from disclosure to recognition and, and see any evidence of any uh, change for them if you did? Sure. Yeah. So um, it, t t we'll start with the second question. So, um, so one of the things that uh, we'd like to have in the paper is, is something pretty much on point with your second comment, which is um, to go through the MDNAs to identify uh, some of the spallies that sort of had this disclosure and recognition effect and to see how they talk about the change um, and to actually say, okay, see, here's evidence to where they said, you know, you know, we have this new pension obligation 
It's killing our balance sheet. We've taken some corrective actions to make sure our financial statements look uh, look as good as, as possible. So that's sort of the ideal thing that um, now that we have sort of sort of the broad empirical uh, result, we'd like to have some of that more granular stuff to add credence to the story. Um, you know, to, to echo sort of one of Gil's comments, if you ask anyone in government uh, what matters, budget or GASB, they'll all say budget. And, and I'm, I'm totally cool with that. That's, that's fine. Um, all we're trying to say is that the GASB also matters uh, uh, a little bit. That's all we're trying to, uh, to, to get at here. So, so I think that one of the things on our to-do list is to go through those MDNAs, really think about um, how it's being presented, uh, and to get some of that granular information. So that's a, that's a great suggestion, uh, and that's something that we're definitely going to do. Um, in terms of the economic magnitudes, uh, we really haven't drilled down into those. So those are continuous measures, um, and so we'd have to do a little bit of work, but that's something we should, we should clearly do as, as well. Um, you know, the net pension... There we go. The net pension liability um, is, as far as the uh, government's concerned, you know, some, some of the um, inputs for that are out of their control. So if you reduce the um, uh, discount rate or the reinvestment rate, that would dramatically inflate it. That the government has no control over. Uh, asset distributions in the uh, pension pool, government has no um, ability to control that. And for the uh, state multi-employer plans, um, you know, the amount that you have to pay as far as your required contribution is actually dictated to you by the state and can vary from, from year to year. So in some respects, a government officer trying to anticipate what the reinvestment rate will be next year or the following year or what the contribution makes this a more difficult uh, behavioral analysis, I think, um, than if they were just looking at debt, which clearly the issuer can control. They can either decide not to issue debt in a particular year uh, for expense savings purpose or uh, cash fund stuff year over year over year like CapEx. So it's, uh, the net pension liability is kind of an interesting animal as far as the liability on the balance sheet. Okay. And I'll just, sorry. Go ahead, Go ahead Jim. And, and just related to Gil's comments. So one thing that um, I didn't emphasize in the presentation, but one thing that we're sort of um, have there is that the, the economics haven't changed, right? So the, the municipalities were responsible for these pension obligations before and after in exactly the same way. So nothing's changed in terms of the economics, in terms of the budget, everything's the same. The one thing that changed is, is sort of the, the GASB. And so that's, that's the part that we're really trying to capture here. Okay, one more question. Uh, Natalie, microphone up here, up front, thank you. Anyhow, the cost share, um, it's an interesting comparison, but a, a bulk of the cost share plans are in education and particularly in higher education. There's some literature out there, you know, just a, a, a basic example is CalPERS versus CalSTRS. And in those situations, you have the legislative body deciding how much is being contributed on the sharing portion as opposed to an actuary. So you have, there are papers that have been written on the funding level. So you might actually find more behavioral change on those types of uh, entities as opposed to the counties. Okay, any other questions? Okay, one in the back, semi-back. Uh, J.P. Aubrey from the Center for Retirement Research at Boston College. Um, I didn't see, and I just may have missed it in the uh, analysis, controlling for um, the actual annual required contribution that's called for. So when you say budget usually is, is, is the factor that impacts decisions, I wonder how much of the uh, decline in expenses is due to a change in the arc that may or may not be related to what was re the, uh, the level of the NPL. So they may actually have real changes in the required contribution that's squeezing out other costs um, rather than uh, it being really the NPL that's driving it. Yeah, yeah we, we can certainly take a look at that. I mean, so, so where we were coming from, you know, in, in terms of looking at um, the, uh, uh, we're tr trying to say, well, what's different? Well, what's different is we now have this NPL that we're sort of disclosing and recognizing that 
that we weren't doing that uh, before. Um, and so that's why we kind of trigger off of, of that uh, measure. Uh, but certainly we could look at um, other things like, I mean, obviously the, the ERC is, is very important. Um, and that's in the CAFRs as well. And then that's something that often flows through the budget as well. So we can certainly look at that and, uh, and how that changes. I mean, so our ex ante going in, sort of the position we we're taking consistent with what, what Natalie said is, whatever the contribution is, whatever your responsibilities are, those aren't changing. Um, yeah, and so we were just kind of ignoring those, but we can certainly confirm that that is in fact the case and, and, and make sure it's appropriate to control if it is. Thank you. Okay, and with that, I think we're out of time. Now we want to transition to our third paper. Thank you, Jim and Gil. Matt. <laughs> okay, paper number three is uh, a legal uncertainty arising from uh, Puerto Rico. Chuck Boyer will present, and Natalie Cohen will moderate or uh, discuss. All right, um, so I'd like to thank the conference for having me. I'm really excited uh, to present this research. So my paper is kind of looking about how state bond markets have reacted recently to legal events um, in the debt crisis in Puerto Rico. This is definitely some earlier stage work, so I'm really excited to hopefully get some feedback, both about my methodology, but kind of more holistically about how I'm thinking about these issues as well. Um, so really, this paper started um, from reading a lot of basically press articles about events that are happening in Puerto Rico. And quite frequently, you see quotes like this. This is one from the bond buyer talking about the legal precedents that are being set in Puerto Rico that could potentially apply down the road if a state government um, someday entered a type of default event. So as we know, um, there's kind of a lot of legal uncertainty around what would happen for a state if they entered some sort of default crisis. Um, state governments do not have access to Chapter 9, um, and there's no really modern precedent for a state going through any sort of default event. And we don't really know what would happen. For instance, the state of Illinois going through some sort of default, how priority would work out between pension holders and um, bondholders. You know, there's been some legal scholarship looking and arguing that perhaps some sort of Chapter 9 uh, protection should be extended to states. So really what I want to do in this paper is think a little bit about how this legal uncertainty might be affecting uh, state bond markets and kind of events in Puerto Rico, I think, are an in interesting laboratory through which uh, to look at this. So really the questions I'm asking in this paper are pretty straightforward. Um, do U.S. state municipal markets, so I'm going to be mostly talking about um, GO bonds, um, but a little bit, one of the more recent legal decisions I look at is more relevant for revenue bonds, so I'll talk about that and the distinction between um, the two. And I'm really just looking at, is do we see reactions and sort of what can we learn from them? Um, how do reactions of prices to these events, what do they imply that the market might be learning about a potential legal environment um, for a state default down the road? And I also want to look at how these effects might differ cross-sectionally. You can imagine something like the PROMISA legislation might be more relevant for a state that's actually closer to default. So a state like Illinois that may have these sorts of issues sooner, um, these sorts of decisions may be more relevant. You might expect to see larger price reactions for a state like that. So kind of a quick preview of what I find. In general, I, fi I do find reactions um, to events that are going on in Puerto Rico. Um, which implies markets may be seeing these as potentially setting precedent for what would happen in the case of a state default. Um, for, I look at four events in particular um, in this version of the paper. Um, for at least three of them, effects are generally negative. Now, I talk a little bit in the paper, and I'll, I'll talk in another slide about this a bit more, about these negative effects um, in prices could in part be attributed to a decrease in legal uncertainty to the extent that these rulings around Puerto Rico were helping investors learn what might happen in a state default, and therefore reducing some sort of uncertainty about that environment, you might expect to see a decrease in spreads. Now, I'm definitely not confident in saying this is what's going on. It's really very much a channel I think that's interesting to explore and something I kind of want to work on a lot more um, going forward. 
So kind of the last event I look at is the most recent Swain decision revolving around revenue bonds in Puerto Rico. And here, I think the evidence is particularly strong in a way that's really not surprising. Um, this is an event that more directly sets an actual legal precedent for what would happen in Chapter 9 bankruptcies. And you see effects, an increase in spreads around this event for state bonds, state revenue bonds. It's not really surprising. Um, I don't find really strong evidence of differences across states. So this channel I had talked about before, where states that are closer to default, you might expect to see larger price reactions. Now, I think this is a bit surprising, but really this kind of touches in my last bullet point here. What I, kind of my empirical strategy as it is currently, there's a lot of noise going on. It's just kind of a difficult exercise to figure out really what are the causal effects of what's going on in a certain event. Um, and both Jim and Kim in their papers talked a lot about their identification strategy and how they're really trying to um, rule out these endogeneity issues. Certainly my paper as it is now, uh, it's subject to a lot of confounding issues that could be driving results and kind of clouding um, the kind of exact directions of what I'm finding. But still, I think it's kind of an important first step in thinking about and trying to understand in a more rigorous way what some of these legal spillovers from Puerto Rico might be on markets. So just kind of quickly, how might we think about these, why would events in Puerto Rico be affecting state bond markets? There's both kind of a level effect in terms of expectations and an uncertainty effect. So right, if you think of bond yields in large part depending on probability of default and recovery rates, to the extent some event in Puerto Rico changes expectations about either of these, you might expect to see um, changes in spreads but also to the extent they reduce or increase uncertainty about um, expectations on probability of default or recovery rates, you might also see um, effects. Basically, as risk-averse investors, we don't like uncertainty. The degree to which any uncertainty about these parameters is reduced from pieces of legislation, we might expect to see uh, decreases in spreads. So what are the kind of the four main events I'm looking at in my paper? Um, so the first two are pieces of legislation that were enacted within Puerto Rico. So we have the Recovery Act first in June of 2014 and the Debt Act uh, in April of 2016. Um, I'm sure there's probably people in this room that know a lot more about the institutional details of these in particular. But basically, these were events helping what Puerto Rico was trying to go through its own process of how it would restructure its own debts. I mean, I will note the first ev event was definitely ultimately found unconstitutional. Um, so to the extent that even the market anticipated that this legislation wouldn't hold up, you might not be surprised if there's no effect that you see initially. And kind of the last two events here are kind of the bigger ones, and, and these are the ones more often where you see talk and press and from people I've talked to about potentially setting precedent in markets. So the first, of course, is PROMISA um, at the end of June in 2016. Um, enacted by Congress to create a bankruptcy framework under which you know, uh, Puerto Rico could restructure debts. So this is the one in particular, there's a good quote from Bernie Sanders about the day after this talking about what a terrible precedent this might set for future state governments that want to go through default. Um, and kind of the last event I'm looking at is the recent uh, decision by Judge Swain ruling that special revenue bond payments by Puerto Rico going through bankruptcy um, might be optional. And this, from kind of what I understand, I'm not a lawyer, is kind of directly contrary to what people believed about Chapter 9 bankruptcy. Um, I'll give Natalie my uh, discussion credit that in the original version of this paper, um, I was not including this event. And I think it's really, in a lot of ways, the most interesting one to look at as it's directly setting a legal precedent um, outside Puerto Rico that we would a priori expect to see um, larger effects and, as I'll show, do in fact. So data, um, I'm using kind of standard uh, bond transaction data from the MSRB, um, linking with Mergent to just get characteristic data. Um, I'm limiting my sample uh, for the first three events anyway to tax-exempt, non-insured, general obligation bonds. I'm just trying to drill down at the like pure credit risk um, effects of these events. Now for the Swain decision, given that that applies particularly to revenue bonds, I limit my sample to only revenue bonds and looking at their effect, the idea there being this is an event which appears to decrease the recover, expected recovery rate of revenue bonds in a default event. So it's in those particular assets we might expect to see a larger effect. Um, now when I talk about 
cross-sectional effects, looking at whether different states um, react differently to events. Um, in the tables I have here and in the paper currently, I'm doing something very simple, just kind of splitting the sample into higher and lower ratings as a proxy for credit quality. Um, I've done this using other kind of more continuous fiscal variables like net pension liabilities or debt asset ratios. Results are very similar, um, so I'm not too concerned about which measure I'm using for now. And really, I'm just going through a basic event study methodology here. So I'm looking at how has the average spread in states changed in windows around these events. So take an event on date T, and I'm looking at what were the spreads X days before date T and X days after, and do we see an average change? And of course, I'm controlling for a number of the characteristics of each bond, time to maturity, issue size, uh, various indicators for callability and redemption type. And I do this for a few different window sizes. So this is really kind of where the issue comes in um, I was discussing about earlier. With, there's a, inherently a lot of noise in what I'm doing. Um, the windows I'm using are relatively large. As we know, municipal bonds are not that liquid. They're not traded that often. So to really pin down um, what's going on for an, a specific event in this sort of methodology is a lot different than it would be for instance, when we do more traditional uh, event studies for equities. Nevertheless, I, I kind of push on. Um, and then my specification here for what I do in looking at cross-sectional effects is now I interact this post uh, variable with an indicator for whether a state had a lower credit rating or not. Again, kind of the null hypothesis going in here is that states with the lower rating after these events, you may expect to see larger effects one way or the other. So kind of, I haven't talked a lot about these events. You can expect effects a priori go either way. If they're changing expectations about recovery rates and default, um, that could be an increase in expectations of the probability of default, a decrease. We could expect spreads to go either way. Um, the Swain decision, I kind of came in with a more hypothesis going in that you'd expect to see an increase in spreads. But really, I, I want this exercise to very much be a what are markets saying about how they interpret these events, and that's kind of the goal uh, of the paper. So kind of looking, I'll go through these events now one by one. So for the Recovery Act in 2014, so going from left to right, I kind of changed the window size to smaller and smaller amounts to kind of try and isolate at least the effects of a given event. Of course, a 10-day window still, there's plenty of other confounding events that could be going on affecting bonds. Um, but I'm trying to get as small as I can with kind of at least keeping um, some of the data given the lack of trades of munis. Um, but we see kind of consistently negative effects, um, a good amount of statistical significance um, for a couple of the smaller windows. Um, I'm also doing a couple different things with errors, um, clustering standard errors, both at QSIP level and day level, worrying about correlation within those groups. Um, so we see here kind of consistently across some st statistical significance. It's not overwhelming, um, but consistently negative effects um, around the window of the Recovery Act for state geos. We see a very similar event for the Debt Act in terms of statistical significance a little stronger. Again, not surprisingly, um, as you get smaller and smaller windows with lower um, amount of power, some of the statistical significance goes away. But again, consistently negative effects around that event. Now kind of going to the last two, looking at Promesa here. This one's a little different and I think even more complicated to interpret than the previous two. We see for the larger windows, we see very similar around eight basis point decreases in state bond spreads around Promesa. Um, as you get to smaller and smaller windows, though, the, the effect actually flips. It's not statistically significant. Again, this is, this is what the data is telling me. Um, so for these three events, anyway, where I look at geos, we see, in general, consistently negative effects, um, a good amount of statistical significance, which is implying that markets might be taking this information into account. And as I talked about briefly, one potential hypothesis, and, and these regressions by no means really are conclusive on this, um, it could be a reduction of uncertainty channel. And that if these events are creating some sort of framework that states might use in a default event, it might not be surprising that that's reducing some uncertainty and spreads are actually going down. 
Um, that's something I'm really interested in looking at in a, in a much more rigorous way going forward. So kind of the last event I'm looking at here, as I talked about, is the Swain decision in 2018, which I think a priori definitely there's a hypothesis that this is decreasing the reco expected recovery rates for revenue bonds. And you see increases in revenue bond spreads around this event um, with a, a good degree of statistical significance across my different specifications. Interestingly, a similar type of effect, eight basis points in terms of magnitude that I get on the decrease of the other events. And as I kind of talked about before, this is, I think, is the cleanest event at what I'm trying to look at in terms of events that are setting legal precedent um, and how they might be uh, spilling over to U.S. states. So kind of the last, I'll talk about this very briefly. I'll just kind of focus on premises. I'm running out of time. These are specifications where I'm looking at the interaction between um, credit quality of states and these events. And in general, I'm just not finding much evidence that there's differing reactions across states. You see my kind of last row here. Basically, effects are around zero basis points and not a lot of statistical significance. So to kind of wrap up, I am finding evidence, that at least for some events, there appear to be some statistically significant reactions to legislation around Puerto Rico. And I think it's important to think about, in a more rigorous way, how these events might be setting legal precedent. And the Swain decision, of course, appears to have the strongest evidence of this. And again, um, I find no evidence of the interaction effects. But as I've kind of talked about a lot, there's a lot of noise inherent in what I'm doing. But I, I still think this is an important first step in trying to understand the role of legal precedent and uncertainty and how that might be spilling over from Puerto Rico uh, to other bond prices. So thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Natalie. Come on up. Okay, thank you. Um, so I agree very much with Chuck that uh, this is important, very important work to be doing to try to understand what we're looking at in the future for those states that have substantially underfunded pensions. He did lightly mention pensions and how those issues will potentially get resolved, um, particularly at the state level. So continuing this line of work is, is important. Um, I'm going to focus a little bit on the noise that Chuck refers to, because I think that he's working in an incredibly difficult time period, um, given a lot of changes that have taken place in the financial environment. And so I think it is important to take some of those factors into account. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the events that he chose to focus on. Um, first of all, the Federal Reserve has played an important role in um, manipulating, maybe too strong, but in influencing and repressing interest rates. And that's a constant factor that that runs through the time period that Chuck is looking at. So it's very hard to tease out that effect from uh, the effect of potential bankruptcy and, and what the market reacts to. Um, and as most people know, the low interest rate environment has pushed a lot of uh, investors into riskier and riskier uh, investments, whether it's on the pension side or in funds and so on, in order to obtain the types of returns and yield and so on. So that has in turn compressed the pricing um, on higher risk, higher yielding uh, credits. Um, one thing that happened in Puerto Rico as it tumbled down uh, the, the sort of death spiral, you might call it, uh, is that the investor base shifted. And I think that's important in considering what might happen when um, other credits, uh, whether it's state or local, start to move down. Um, the, the time period that is noted um, was after the rating agencies had downgraded the Puerto Rico Commonwealth uh, names substantially, um, mutual funds had been selling off their assets. Uh, mom and pop investors were selling off their assets. Hedge funds were entering the market. It was after um, the, the, the next event was after uh, the Commonwealth had sold its large 
um, high risk to th March 2014 uh, issue. Um, other factors include changes uh, for names that are eligible for indexes, for example. That definitely affects pricing. And at some point in time, uh, I know S&P took Puerto Rico's names out of the index. That certainly has a spillover effect into other, other credits and affects ETF investors, which are a bigger and bigger part of this market. Um, so I would wager that going forward some similar patterns may happen with other states. Um, the other thing, again, that happened as a result of the change in the investor base is that at some point the market shifted from looking at uh, coupon and interest rates and yields to dollar bond pricing. So, you know, high yield bottom fisher investors might purchase a Commonwealth piece of paper at 20 and sell it at 25. They've made a ton of money if they have a substantial investment. So it went from the interest rate uh, coupon clipping uh, investor to a dollar bond investor. Um, I have some comments. I think the Windows is very interesting. When I was reading his his window time frames, um, you know, I started getting a headache trying to imagine high frequency trading in the municipal market, and that's certainly no, no, that won't happen and doesn't happen and can't because of the way that the market is currently structured. So the Windows, um, and I'm going to get to this in a minute. Uh, we're kind of, you know, the desire for an instantaneous reaction is something that may happen in the um, anonymous equity markets, but in the municipal market, it's just so utterly sticky that it's hard to hard to tease that out, and it makes it very difficult to read the signaling of price pricing measures. Um, finally, uh, another key important thing that everyone who understands the municipal market on the tax exempt side is tax policy, and your your research. Uh, bridges um, some major changes in tax policy. If we look at the years leading up to the 2016 presidential election, municipals had a really good run uh, anticipating that candidate Clinton would win the election, taxes would go up, and the tax exempt had greater value. Um, once it was noticed the day after the election, there was almost a 100 basis point move in the markets because of the expectation that taxes would be brought down, um, it, this would be a big boost for corporate uh, corporations and so on and so forth. So that's, that's another very noisy factor. Um, dialing it back a little bit in the summer of 2013, which was very important for Puerto Rico as well as the municipal market, um, then Chair, Federal Reserve Chair Ben Bernanke had indicated that he was going to start um, tapering down the, uh, the quantitative easing approach that the Federal Reserve had been on. Um, and it, there was a significant taper tantrum that took place. Again, another 100 basis point move. That was right at the same point in time that the city of Detroit filed its bankruptcy petition. And then if some of you recall, at the end of um, August, Barron's had a headline first page uh, study that disclosed a lot of the problems in Puerto Rico called Troubling Winds. And if you haven't read it, you might, you might pull that up. So those events in combination had major effects on pricing, confidence, and expectations, I would argue. And there were outflows in uh, mutual funds as well during that time period. OK, so in this context, I know I'm running out of time. A few really quick comments. The first event, the Public Corporation Debt in Enforcement and Recovery Act, um, again, as I mentioned, that happened after there was a shift in the investor base. The, um, the high yield investors that were in the market and had those bonds understood that it was likely unconstitutional. So in a sense, there was a certainty at that point in time. And it's not surprising that you had a differential in the windows, the time frame, um, for that particular event. I'm going to quickly jump to the Judge Swain um, Discussion. I want to just make one quick correction. I don't think the judge's decision was that it was optional for Puerto Rico to continue paying, but rather um, that uh, you know, Chapter Nine in its in its fundamental is a voluntary proceeding, unlike Chapter Eleven. Uh, I think what she was saying is that the the revenue bonds were not subject to the stay. I mean, they 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 were not that the market expected 
revenue bonds not to be subject to the stay in bankruptcy. And that, in fact, if you go to the administrative court's webpage and you read their ex explanation of Chapter 9, it specifically says that revenue bonds will continue to be paid during a bankruptcy. So the market very seriously expected that to take place. I think what she was saying is not that they don't have to pay and it's at their option, but that the court cannot force the borrower to continue to pay. So that, it's a very disputed decision. Um, ultimately, I think where we're going, and if you look at what's going on in Puerto Rico right now, is it's an extraordinarily messy um, solution. And it is negotiated. It is repeatedly negotiated. So the search for a clear path is really um, not quite in the bankruptcy code, it's really in the negotiation. I know I'm running over, but I think in the in the Detroit situation, the solutions were outside of the bankruptcy code. The grand bargain had to do with um, a very strong emergency manager and the governor and the legislature and the foundations in the Detroit area that came together and said, we're going to have to pony up for this. And so that was outside of bankruptcy as a solution. I'll stop because I'm over in time for questions. OK, um, uh, fast on time here. A quick question that I'll open with, and maybe this is just a yes or no answer. Uh, we took a lot of confidence in the market with the Judge Rhodes' decision to protect the Detroit water and sewer bonds. Uh, were that, and Judge Swain didn't take a page out of that playbook. Um, were those events to be reversed in time? Uh, do you think Judge Rhodes might have viewed Detroit water and Siri, uh, sewer any, any differently? This button, the button with the mouth. Um, OK. <laughs> um, the Detroit water and sewer was a very interesting example because I believe that the uh, the emergency manager backed away a little bit. It was a voluntary tender. It wasn't a forced tender that you might see in a Chapter 11 situation. I got a lot of calls at that point in time from investors saying, should I or shouldn't I? And I, I was confident in the special revenue doctrine. And I said, if you can hold on, bite your tongue and bite your lip and you know, whatever. In any event, at the end of the day, the investors that held on were were whole. Um, so would the decision, I, I, I don't, it's a nuance of her decision. I don't think, I don't think he would do something differently. Okay, we got a question. Uh, Micah Green, go ahead. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Thank you, I appreciate your presentations. Yeah, when, you, when you look at the process in Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. you, there, there were statements made, public statements made by the governor, you know, Padilla, saying we're not going to pay bonds. And you could argue that, that and particularly the Cofina bonds, and you could argue that that talked down the market, that retail investors got scared. And it became a marketplace where hedge funds and other distressed debt buyers were coming in, buying a depressed marketplace. And you saw what the Cofina deal ended up happening, you know, paying the senior Cofinas over 90 cents on the dollar. And you could argue that, that that's a problem for the muni market because the muni market has so historically been you know, retail-based. And if the retail marketplace can be talked out of their holdings and then four years later they're paid at 95 cents, and those are even the uninsured ones, that, that, that's a question. And PROMESA was not just a bankruptcy code. It was a process by which you were supposed to first have fiscal reform and, 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 and fiscal, and, you know, and, 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 a, and, and a fiscal plan that was based on reduced spending and other fiscal constraints for essential services. But what happened was the board ended up rushing to the fiscal plan to preserve the stay. And arguably speaking, negotiations for restructurings should have been going on long before they went to Title III coverage and the stays would have been extended through forbearance. So you have a, a, a cascading of events that led to the Swain decision. And the one big decision most recently that you're leaving out is the, 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 the decision by the board to invalidate 2014 and 2012 GO bonds as saying not only, you know, not only were they illegally issued, but because they were illegally issued, we no longer owe the money. So it's not just saying 
you know, you know, we'll return the money that the bonds are dead. They're saying we don't owe you the investor money. You already see downgrades, you know, in Illinois on special revenue bonds. So there, there is a real world contagion effect to this, in part because PROMESA wasn't followed to the sequencing that it was supposed to have. If restructurings could have been more readily negotiated the way PREP is and the way COFINA was, restructurings that are negotiated don't set precedent. The parties to the transaction have agreed to it. People may disagree with what they end, where they ended up, but it doesn't set a precedent that some external body can come down and demand uh, an outcome, which then leads to a precedent. So I'm, I'm just curious, you know, with these other factors, you know, the process of PROMESA and the invalidation efforts, if, if, if you have anything to add from, from, your, from your research and study. Thank you. No, I, I think it's an interesting point. Obviously, I'm very much looking at, in what I'm doing, the passage of the legislation itself. I don't really follow it. It's probably something I should think more about, is how is the actual implementation of that, right? It, it, to the extent that my hypothesis being that other markets might be learning something about other, um, how even how the process would work out in the state of Illinois. It might be interesting to follow that process. It's not something I do. And, and I'm, I'm sensitive to your point that um, you can say whatever you want about a piece of legislation, but it's how it actually follows through. It's whatever the process is um, going forward. And it's kind of Natalie touched on, it's just, it's murky to kind of then think about, you know, with the negotiation process that's going on and, and the following through of PROMESA, it, how do you define events? What's exactly happening? I, it, as much as I can, as an economist, trying to find stark events as setting some sort of precedent, I'm trying to do that. Um, it would obviously be more interesting if I could certainly at a high frequency level, as you talked about, follow all the sorts of minutia of what's going on. It's just, it's harder to do, I think. I mean, in fairness, I think, you know, Chuck had to cut off his event studies at a certain point, but the invalidation is certainly an interesting one to follow. There was recently a proposal in the state of Illinois to invalidate bonds by a former governor's staff okay. aide or whatever. I don't know what his title was, but um, anyhow, go ahead. Okay. okay, to everyone who's been persistent out there and I know who you are, uh, I apologize. Uh, we have really, uh, uh, we've run out of time. Uh, lots of loaded subjects here. Uh, thank you both, uh, Chuck and Natalie. <clears throat> so we'll adjourn now to the regular session. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.